Welcome, welcome every, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. This webinar is on how to start or build up your family law practice and a collaboration between the Houston Lawyer Referral Service, the Houston Bar Association, and the Association of Women Attorneys. My name is Dahlia Castillo Granados, and I am on the board of the Houston Lawyer Referral Service and the Association of Women Attorneys. In my day job, I direct a project at the American Bar Association called the Children's Immigration Law Academy. We have a wonderful panel of experienced family law practitioners uh, with you today, and I will be happy to introduce them next. First, though, a few housekeeping matters. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the HLRS website. We will leave time for questions at the end, so please feel free to add them to the Q&A box and we will try to get to all of them. Each registrant received a confirmation email upon registering for this free CLE that included the CLE course number to self-report to the state bar. If anyone needs the course number, you can email Karen Ramsey, Executive Director of the HLRS at kramsey at hlrs.org. Now I'm happy to introduce our esteemed panel. We have Daniel Chung Lee of CY Lee Law Group, Brenda DeRowan of the DeRowan Law Firm, Susan O of Jenkins and Cayman LLP, and Rachel Sadita of Diggs and Sadler. Before I let them introduce themselves, I wanna talk a little bit about HLRS. Um, it was established in 1958, and it is a nonprofit organization that provides referrals to community members um, to an attorney. The HLRS is sponsored by nine local bar associations, is certified by the State Bar of Texas, and is one of the select few programs nationwide that meets the standards of the American Bar Association. The HLRS has attorney members that can accept cases from 38 different legal categories. There are great benefits to becoming a member of HLRS. You get pre-screen referrals to individuals that are actively seeking representation. Members earn an average of $20,000 annually from HLRS referred clients, and it's a great way to build up a clientele base. One of the areas where many community um, members call in to get a referral is family law, um, and that's why we have this great group of family law practitioners with you today. So, I will now turn it over to our panelists and I'll ask each one of them to tell you a little bit about themselves and why they decide to focus their career on family law. I'll start with Susan. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Susan Ohl. I'm a partner at Jenkins and Cayman. I have been exclusively practicing family law for 16 years now and uh, I'm happy to be a part of this panel and contribute what I can. Thanks so much, Susan. And I'll turn it over to Rachel. Hi there, I'm Rachel Sedita, and I have been practicing family law for almost 10 years now. Uh, I'm a shareholder with Diggs and Sadler. I've been there my whole career. Um, and one of the things that attracted me to family law as a career choice was that my clients are people and people who are going through all sorts of different things. And I really liked that aspect of working with individuals to get through a hard time. And, and litigation. Litigation is also a really attractive factor for me. Thanks, Rachel. I'll turn it over to Daniel. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Lee. Um, I'm the owner and managing partner for CY Lee Legal Group. Uh, I've been practicing mainly in family law for the last uh, 12 years, I think. And uh, I started out doing my first family law case through the uh, Houston Volunteer Lawyers Program, um, uh, helping out a um, child support, I guess, uh, respondent that, that was looking at jail time. And, and since then, um, I think I've gotten uh, hooked and had clients that, for whatever reason, needed me. And um, it just felt like the right fit for me. Um, I can't say that for everyone, but you know, if you really have a heart for service and uh, for those that you know are in their worst place in life, um, and you want to help help them out and help them get out of that point, uh, this is the field for you. Thanks, Daniel and Brenda. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Brenda Duran. I am the managing attorney of Duran Law Firm, a boutique family law firm. Um, I uh, started practicing, I believe, in 2018 and made my practice specifically, uh, exclusively family law. I actually started off as a criminal defense attorney and working in politics. Um, I fell in love with family law after my own custody case um, when I didn't know anything about family law, I didn't have any interest in family law. Um, and just kind of like Daniel and Rachel said, you know, you kind of fall in love with helping people through tough times. And so I'm so excited uh, to share my experiences with you and to be uh, serving on this panel. Thank you, Brenda. So we'll start with our first question here. Um, and anyone that is ready to answer the question, please unmute yourself and, and um, and tell us, uh, so what is challenging about being a family law attorney? I can weigh on in this. <laughs> and I guess I didn't really answer your question, Dahlia, so I apologize. I also got into family law because I had a heart for serving people and helping families through difficult transitions. Um, and so just wanted to, to add that. But I would say the most difficult part about family practice for me is um, emotion management and expectation management and making sure that you are clear from the outset when you're representing a client or or potentially going to be representing a client about how to get those in check um so th those are the two aspects I, I i find the most tasking in in my practice and just to jump in there, I completely agree with Susan. That is the hardest part and sometimes the most heartbreaking part of uh, family law. And one of the things, especially as a new practitioner that I, I know I struggled with and a lot of people do, is realizing what you can and can't fix in someone's situation. And, you know, your job is to be a uh, help someone through a specific period of time. You can't fix someone's entire life. You can't um, fix a situation. You can't change people even though you know, that's maybe what you're being asked to do. So being very clear as to what you're capable of doing, what the courts are capable of doing and um, making sure to control the um, emotionality of the parties and sometimes yourself involved, um, that can be one of the most challenging aspects of the job. I, I would say the same. Um, family law is a very emotional uh, area of practice to be in. And so sometimes, you want to help so bad that you kind of get drawn into your client's cases. So understanding how to create balance and understanding that you are not a magician, you are an attorney and the facts are the facts and you can't, <laughs> you really can't change that. Another thing when I first started, um, I'm still fairly young, I like to think, um, just being a, a young attorney and coming into the courtroom and demanding you know, respect, I think that was very hard for me um, initially, um, just not, necessarily being taken seriously when I entered the courtroom. So that was something um, that I'm sure we'll talk about later, but that was definitely a challenge. Yeah, and I and I definitely would agree with everyone that um, the emotional uh, aspect of it is the most difficult. Uh, what I find is a good solution is to have uh, good staff there that you can bounce ideas off of and essentially um, potentially take over in communicating with uh, those types of clients where uh, there's certain situations where we feel personally invested in it. And sometimes we need someone else like around just to jump in and tell us, hey, um, this is not your your case, this is your client's case. And that we truly need to you know, have that available uh, there for us. So when you build your practice, Make sure you're not by yourself. And uh, I, this is a very stressful um, field of law. Uh, if you need therapy or you need to suggest your client specifically to get therapy, you're not their therapist. Um, make sure that you advise them properly. Thank you all for sharing. I'm sure it's really hard to establish those boundaries, especially when you know people are going through one of the hardest times in their life. So um, I can certainly understand that. So sort of on the flip side, what is most rewarding about being a family law attorney? 
I will say the same thing, right? Helping people, like uh, you, you get to work on so many different cases and, and be impact with so many different families. I know for me, um, I don't know if this gender bias or whatever, but there is a, a status quo or you know an issue with a lot of times a fathers thinking that they come into the family law system and that you know they're not being heard. Um, so a lot of times when I'm able to show clients that hey that's not necessarily true, you just kind of have to you fight and make sure that your story is being heard. And, and when they see that, you know, it brings joy to my face because they're so happy uh, to know that there's a, someone fighting for them and being an advocate for them. So I get joy of just seeing you know the relief taken off of uh, uh, my clients. Yeah, I would echo what Brenda said. I, I think the the rush of joy or adrenaline that you get from um, accomplishing the goals that you and your clients set out to achieve at the beginning of their case uh, is, is super rewarding and keep, keeps you hungry to keep helping people, even though this can be stressful on us as practitioners, this practice. Um, and, you know, I, I also think that being able to utilize other channels rather than going directly to the courthouse and piecing the puzzle together and getting to learn about the, the family dynamic and learning about the kids and learning about the property and, and trying to piece this puzzle together and come up with other creative solutions um, and to see those come to fruition, either, you know, at the end of a long mediation or extensive um, settlement negotiations is, is really rewarding. Just to echo again what my colleagues have said, I, uh, one of the great things about this practice is that, you know, no two cases are alike. You may have um, uh, hundreds of divorces on your docket, but no two are similar. Everyone's family situation is different. So, in the very real sense, each case you come in fresh and with different options. And there are a lot of opportunities for creative problem solving that don't lead to the courthouse. Though I will say if, as a young practitioner, if you are looking to spend time in the courthouse, if you are looking to litigate, family law is a good opportunity for that. And that you do get the opportunity to have contested evidentiary hearings very quickly. Um, you get some multiple <laughs> opportunities usually in a case even if a case does ultimately settle. So it is a great opportunity for young lawyers to get litigation experience, to get courthouse um, familiarity as well. I, I'd, I'd like to say adoptions. My favorite part is adoptions all day. Um, I, I would agree with everyone else, but if I had to pick one part of it, it would probably have to, you know, be uh, having a child that, um, was in a difficult situation and putting them in a, in a better situation um, and being in, being blessed and, you know, honored to be able to be a part of it. Um, it's the only thing that we have in the courthouse that I know of other than marriages that there is a round of applause um, after a hearing and you won't get a round of applause after a divorce hearing. That does sound really fulfilling, uh, but so so do um, so does walking with your client, being with them, um, you know, when they're going through this this very difficult time. So for you know for all of our um, audience members that are thinking about starting their own law practice or you know switching practice, um, what is your recommendation on what they need um, if they decide that they want to start a family law practice? Oh, well, I'm going to echo what Daniel said. You cannot do this practice solo. You need at least one solid staff member, um, not only to help you with pleadings, discovery, keeping the file organized, because in family law, things, things can change almost daily. Um, situations can change. Having to, you know, head down a different path strategy-wise, and you need someone, someone to serve as a gatekeeper, um, that's imperative. And also I would say, whether you do it via contract or you bring someone on um, as an office manager or a business manager to run your books, definitely key to keep that clear because you will get so overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day of practice that if you don't have someone that's doing things on the, on the backside of what your practice entails and making sure that you're collecting fees, 
keeping your fees organized so that when you do have to go to court and prove up your fees, you've got a clear record of what's going on. So I would say solid staff to help with the litigation aspect and then someone that's helping you run the books. So I would say, um, I think for me, it took me a while before I could actually afford to have support staff. So when I started my practice, I didn't have a dime. Like I literally had to just take a case and figure it out. Um, I always tell people when you have a license to do anything, whether it's be a barber or, you know, be a esthetician or something, you have a, a, a license to make money. So to kind of resolve some of the issues of being overwhelmed, take on as little, like not, not a lot of cases at a time so that you can manage and you can put systems in place so that when you do bring on someone, you already know what that system looks like. So before I even got started, I had lots of time downtime. I created contracts. I, I put systems in place. Like, okay, when I get a new client, what does that process look like? So the first thing first is create a process. You will always fine tune that, fine tune that, fine tune that, sorry. To this day, I'm still fine tuning my, my intake process, my discovery process, communications with clients. So first things first is get some processes in place. Uh, the second thing I would say is have a case management software so that you can have everything in one place for yourself and for your clients. Um, I currently use my case. I think it's amazing. I think, you know, it, it helps with organization. It helps with uh, billing time. It also helps with communicating with clients. And then the last thing, if there could be only three things that I picked, get an accountant. Um, that was somebody that I did hire um, to, to make sure that I was doing what I needed to do because handling a trust account with family law is, is a serious responsibility and you do not want to get in trouble with the state bar of Texas for not um, being able to account for the money that's going in as well as the money that's going out. Just to echo what Brenda and Susan both said, um, you know, really what you need to practice uh, family law is you need a law license, an IELTA account, and a computer. <laughs> um, you can do, you can get started with all of those things. Ideally, you will build, and again, just from the emotionality of the job, having people to practice with, even if you can't afford to full staff, having mentors or people to bounce ideas off of will be very helpful. Um, Obviously, you need to be careful if they don't work with you that you can't go into details of your case, but you, you do need to have people. Um, but the two things you can really get in trouble with with bar, I mean, there's many things, but um, the things most common are messing with client money and client communications, both very important things in family law. Um, and, you know, we, one of the important things is, like Brenda said, be very cautious with your client's money and how you handle it in your trust accounts. And um, when you bill it, it needs to be billed appropriately. Billing software is very helpful with that. Um, but in order to really get started, there's a lot of really good uh, resources out there. Um, a subscription to the Family Law Practice Manual is something that can really help people get started. It's a form book that um, is a good starting point for, you know, most pleadings that you'll be dealing with, most responses, a lot of orders. Um, it's a it's a good starting place, and um, the advice I have is don't <laughs> feel free to deviate <laughs> when your situation calls for it. It's not something that you're stuck with for life, but it is a great starting point. And with that, you can usually figure out at least a way to respond to a certain situation, or or file a pleading, or get get something in front of the court for your, your client's particular situation. Those are I'd, I'd say the um, and, and the family code. You want the family code as well, but with those resources, you could. You're dangerous and you're ready to go. So I was going to chime here, chime in here, and and since I'm coming from a, a a bigger firm that has a lot of support and resources, I would say for those folks who are trying to start their own family law practice, that you know a lot of resources are available on the State Bar of Texas website. Utilize your membership. Um, the family code, the statutes are available. The family codes on there. Um, I agree with Rachel, the Texas Family Law Practice Manual is the foundational quote unquote Bible of family law. Um, and if you do have the resources, I would also highly recommend getting the Texas Family Law Handbook, which is a nice complement to walking you through, depending on how you receive information. If you need something explained, the statutes have got you all turned around, then the, the Family Law Handbook is, is an excellent resource. So if you you only have to rely on the State Bar of Texas website to access the Texas Family Code, that maybe consider investing not only in the Texas Family Law Practice Manual, but also the Family Law Handbook. 
And I would say um, if you're starting out, uh, you don't have a lot of money, you don't have uh, aces coming in, uh, go volunteer. Go jump on the uh, Houston Volunteer Lawyers Program. They actually have uh, free resources for you to use. Um, they do have a copy of the uh, Family Law Handbook and uh, all the things that Susan just mentioned for free if you're taking on a case. So if you don't really know what you're doing, you're, you know, getting um, your your beak wet, uh, get a mentor first, please. Go get yourself a mentor. Don't guess. This is not the time to guess. Um, go get yourself a mentor, pick up a, a volunteer case. And um, if you have issues with um, marketing, getting cases, well, uh, go go get yourself um, the uh a, a subscription to the Houston Law Referral Service. Um, you know, I built my practice through them. And uh, in addition to that, you know, you you obviously have to get, um, to qualify, you still have to get uh, your application approved and um, get your malpractice insurance to protect yourself. So to Daniel's point, uh, you know, once you have that license, IOLTA account and computer, as Rachel said, how do you get experience? How do you, um, you know, learn more about um, the family law practice? Well, in addition to what Daniel just recommended, which is really the option, um, if you are in the situation where you're looking to build your practice, you don't have the cases yet, I would, you know, find a friend who's been doing this, who's someone that is in the community. You'll find that, I mean, the family law community is, is large and small at the same time, I'd say. Um, there's a lot of people out there, but you see people often and go to the courthouse, follow them to the courthouse, uh, see, you know, observe a trial if you have the opportunity to second share a trial. I mean, just try to get whatever experience in, uh, that you can so that when your cases do uh, start to materialize, you know what to do. You've seen the situation. You can speak with some experience as to what um, can expect from court. Um, I, I, that's finding a friend who's been doing this and asking them questions is really gonna be your best resource. And I've found that there, there's a lot of people willing to, to do that. You're not gonna run into people as acting as gatekeepers, preventing you from getting work. There's plenty of work in the family law community. I agree with Rachel. Um, if you're just getting started and you, you just don't know, you know family law at all, one thing that was very helpful for me was just sitting in the courtroom, you know, watching the different attorneys and you'll start seeing who's who, who knows what they're doing, who doesn't know what they're doing, um, what the judges like. Um, that's very important, how they want you to practice in their courtroom. Um, and then also reach out to some attorneys. Uh, there are a lot of solo practitioners who need help. Um, we hate doing discovery. And so I feel like that's the best way to get in on a case. You get to see all the evidence in the case and you really get to see how, how attorneys are using this evidence to litigate their cases. Um, ask to sit second chair, ask to help in any way, you know, with a, with a trial or a hearing. And I think that you'll, you'll start to see how the people is fall with family law. So I'm sure there's many different areas that you can develop expertise in. So how do you sort of decide, um, you know, where to sort of focus your practice? And is that a good idea? Is it good to, to um, focus on one area? Or do you recommend sort of becoming an expert in all areas of family law? I would suggest uh trying to pick your spot, um, shore that part up, uh, build your firm around what you find that you're good at. Uh, pick a divorce, try an adoption, um, do some custody cases. And uh, family law is pretty broad. I mean, it's small, but it's also very broad. There's a lot of components. I could honestly tell you there's um, components that I'm stronger in than, than someone else uh, and vice versa. And so, um, but try to stay, you know, within the family law program, because you can also get referrals, um, you know, from PI lawyers and criminal. If you spread yourself too wide, then uh, your friends that do PI, your friends that do criminal, uh, they might get upset with you and say, well, what are you doing in our lane? And number two, it, it's difficult to juggle all the law changes. So if you're already trying to focus on the legislative changes that are happening this year for family. Now you got to switch gears, you know, 
the next day or maybe even the next hour to remember all this stuff you you know have to do for the civil case and it'll there'll be it'll be a uh, a little bit of a repeat of what we did during the bar exam where you're trying to cram all this information but now you're doing it with someone's life on the line which is sometimes unfair you know to your client as well just to sort of follow up on that i would say as you start off, get experience in different parts of family law. You're, there's a ton of different types of cases out there. You need to see what they all look like and th what what it is that draws you to it. And if you know you want to get really, uh, you know, build your practice on a property uh, case versus a custody case, you know, you can do that having experience done that. Um, how do you get particular experience? Um, I would say there's certain cases that you know maybe are a little harder to market for, a little harder to come by. Um, we all love adoption cases. I, I know that sometimes those are a little more fewer and further between than in certain areas than others. Um, but one thing to do is just look for an opportunity and ask. Um, if you know of a case that's coming up, if you see something on the docket, if you know people in the community and be like, you know, I've always wanted to work on that kind of case, or I've always wanted to do a jury trial or something like that in family law, which is a whole <laughs> specific issue, um, you know, ask, can I shadow? Can I second chair? What can I do to help? Um, if you're also trying to build up knowledge and expertise on a certain thing, tr try to attend a CLE. Um, CLEs can be very expensive. There's the advanced uh, family law CLE that is in San Antonio every year. Um, that is with a whole lot of different topics on all sorts of areas of family law. And um, I know that there are scholarships available through the HBA and other opportunities to attend that at a low or discounted cost. Um, and I would recommend that if there's a particular area of expertise you're looking for, or um, to try to find a CLE, maybe a, wet, a replay of an old CLE to, to get some, you know, practical tips on how to handle those situations. Yeah, and to, sorry, go ahead, Brenda. I was just going to say, um, the beautiful thing about family law is if you choose to do family law, you literally choose to do all types of law. You know, we have family law cases that are, are, are heavily relying on the property code. We have uh, cases that you will deal with criminal issues. We have cases that will deal with tax issues. I mean, we touch everything in family law. And so if you are interested in other areas of law, I think family law is the best one to kind of practice so that you get a little bit of everything. Yeah, that's ex you took the words out of my mouth. People underestimate family law. I think that we stay in one lane. But I mean, tax, bankruptcy, agency and partnerships, the the Texas Business and Organizations Code, all of these things come into play in our cases. Um, so you really do get a plethora of experience depending on the issues in a case that you're working on. And the other thing that I would say is um, going to court, yes, but who has time to sit in court and watch the entire day or morning of docket? go up and familiarize yourself with the court staff. That's one thing that I have prided myself on doing since I started practicing. Get get to know the court staff because they could be a resource to you. It's like, you know, hey, this, this attorney may be a good mentor for you. Um, so rely on the court staff and, and familiarize yourself with them so they can also familiarize themselves with you. And then you're not walking in like a perfect stranger and um, and, and having you know, some of the issues that we, often have as younger lawyers or lawyers that are just breaking into this niche of practice where you're you're an unknown and people don't take you seriously. If if you put yourself out there, then it it will merit a lot of reward. That's a great tip. Um, so you know you've you've got your law practice, hopefully you've got some experience. How do you attract clients? How did you attract clients when you first started practicing? Well, the first thing I'll say was with family law, everyone in the world is a potential client or a potential referral source. And that's something that I wish I understood better when I was a young lawyer. Um, but one of the things you can do is just tell people you practice and that you're interested in cases, asking. And it's sometimes very difficult. I found it very difficult as a young female lawyer to just put yourself out there. It's something that 
is didn't come natural, but you know, just say, hey, I practice and I practice family law. I'd be happy to take care of any clients you refer my way. Um, it sometimes is hard to attend a networking event by yourself to try to try to do that, but um, just for social anxiety reasons, I found always found it easier to bring a buddy and say, hey, this person's great, and this my buddy will say that I'm great, and so that kind of helps with that. Um, but get business cards, tell people you practice. Um, and again, anyone is a potential referral source in this area of law. Um, so, you know, from the, you can get personal, those personal referral clients are going to be probably your best clients because they, someone told them that you're good at this or referred you them. So they're already more inclined to hire you than anyone else that from any internet search or anything else. And those can be some of the best clients. I think the times have changed when it comes to marketing yourself as a family law attorney. If anyone knows me, I am heavy on social media. Um, I market, market, market family law. If there is anything in the news pertaining to family law, I'm talking about it. I'm on the blogs responding about, you know, what Texas law would say. And so you don't, I mean, before, I, I don't even know how I would have gotten clients before, you know, social media is literally at our fingertips. And this is the best marketing you could start off with if you have never had clients before is just putting it out there in the universe that I'm a family law attorney. Um, I had a unique circumstance that kind of allowed that to propel a lot faster than most people, but definitely, like Rachel said, anytime you go somewhere, you should be saying, I am a family law attorney, so that people know who you are, know what practice area you do. I will say, um, one of my mess ups was when I first started, I was like, yeah, family law, criminal law, personal injury. And so when people are looking to refer an attorney, they're not looking, hey, Brenda Duran does, what does she do again? Right. And so now I've rebranded and marked myself. I am a family law attorney. And so when they think of family law, a lot of times people think of me, even my, you know, connect with people who don't practice in your area. A lot of personal injury attorneys will refer me cases because I'm not competition to them. Right. And so I think that's the best way to go. And also, if you if you went to law school in the area, uh, I went to South Texas. Um, and I get a, a bunch of referrals or even just inquiries from some of my old classmates and stay connected with them. So relying on a community of, you know, former law students that you went, you went through the, went through the trenches with um, to get to where you all are respectively in your practice. That's another way to reach out without feeling like you're stepping on someone else's toes and possibly taking business away from them because I, I get tons of referrals from some of my old classmates that do other areas of law and, and don't want to touch family law, but they know that I exclusively practice family law and have since, since I got my bar part. So that, that does help when you are focused in on one area. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everyone. Um, uh, in addition to that, when, when I was starting out, I, I did uh, have a firm that I was with that um, had a subscription with the Houston Law Referral Service. Um, I think that, you know, that was one uh, fairly inexpensive way because, you know, marketing is pretty expensive. So are billboards and things like that. There's a lot of effort involved, but, you know, for a small price of, I think, I think it's like 500 bucks or a little bit less than that. Um, you know, you'll get phone calls, you know, so if your phone's not ringing, um, one of the easiest ways to get phone calls is just to sign up with them and they'll send you uh, already pre-screened leads, which I believe uh, uh, most of the time they're, they're pretty good leads and, and you should be able to, you know, churn that out uh, really fast and get you some more money so you can start doing the types of uh, social media marketing or I'm sorry, dues are 175. That's my fault. Um, so just saw that in the chat. Um, so it's a lot cheaper than that, uh, you know, uh, probably a Starbucks coffee every day for a month, right? Um, so long story short, uh, that's that's one of the ways I did it. Um, I would also suggest uh, TikTok. Um, I've seen people grow through that. Uh, I will say just kind of be careful about if you're starting out and, um, you know, your social media has too much social 
right? Um, just just kind of be careful and be cognizant of that and just use common sense when you're when you're posting because you know you are an attorney and um, you know people will start you know judging you for certain things you may have may not say politically or you know socially when when you're posting things. Well, the only, actually, one other thing to add is if, as a family law attorney trying to get experience, another way to get more experience is to get on the ad litem wheels with the court, with the specific courts. Um, each court has a different process for how they, they do that. Um, it's an appointment situation where the court will appoint you. And um, But I recommend looking into each uh, family court's specific rules about how to get on that list. And uh, you can get casework through that. That's a great tip. So what, and you know, we spoke about marketing a little bit, but what are your top three marketing tips? SEO, search engine optimization, putting content out there. That's something that I've had to propel my firm into because um, the founding partners were around for a while and, and one of them is not yet retired. And they didn't need to do a lot of marketing, but as we grew and as technology has developed, you know, just evolved and, and just the way that we live in, in, in this day and age, it's technology at your fingertips. And so you have to put content out there to attract attention to your practice. Um, so by doing blogs, so Brenda sounds like she's, um, pretty astute about doing that. We, we try to put that out, but it, it has to be intentional and you have to be very, very careful about what you say, kind of like what Daniel was saying. So I, I usually kind of use the gut check when in doubt, don't, um, or run it past somebody or, you know, rely on a mentor. Hey, does this seem like I'm heading in the right direction about the content that I'm putting out there? But SEO is huge. I would say um, if you can't, if you can remember this, it's CCW, content, community, and website. So always create content, whether it's on social media, whether it's writing a blog, you can write for the State Bar of Texas, you can write for just different articles, you know, just different um, uh, publishers, just get content out there. Even if it's not writing, maybe you do TikTok, maybe you do stuff on Instagram and create reels a day in the life of an attorney. Like all these different things is all content. Create it, create it, create it. And that content should go back to your website. Uh, community, engaging your community. People are bringing their families out, host events, show up at events, speak on panels, um, speak at churches, speak at anything that you can do to engage in your community. Do that and also bring content that refers back to your website um, and have a website. If you don't have a website, people are not going to take you seriously. They don't know where to go to get your information. Where is your office? What is your contact information? How do I get uh, in contact with you? And then your website goes back with content and community, right? Your, your website should have still have content that goes out to whatever you're doing in the community and whatever you're doing on social media. So CCW, content, community, and website. And, and if you're having uh, problems with, you know, funding and trying to fund the websites, I know Scorpion's like 1400 a month, which, which might be steep for some, um, you can always try Fiverr or, you know, even look at next door to see if there's anybody, um, you know, that does it locally, that'll do it so that you can keep your, keep your website with the one-time fee instead of having to pay monthly. But, you know, you, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't go, uh, cheap unless I knew the person, uh, because your website and the ability to have mobile, like it needs to be clean on the mobile, um, means everything, you know, just because you have a website on the computer doesn't mean that it works like it should on the phone. So you have to make sure that all of it, you know, comes together, especially now that everyone uses their phone instead of a computer, uh, make sure you have a payment link on your on your website so they can pay you, right? Uh, that's very very important. And you know, go use LawPay and try to get um, you know a credit card, uh, you know, so that they can pay with credit cards and things like that. Uh, the other thing I would say is that um, you know, try to try to put out content there in every avenue, 
Okay. And, and there's, there's platforms available where you post on Instagram and it automatically hits the rest of it and schedule it out. Cause maybe your schedule is like, well, I have all these hearings every day. Like I can't do it, but my Saturdays are free. There's platforms available where you can have, you post all your week long or month long um, uh, content at the same time. And then it slowly just leaks it out that way. So always make time uh, to, to make content and use whatever platforms you need to use to, to get it out there. The only thing I will add to this is have professional pictures taken for your website. Don't, you know, rely on candids. Those are never going to be as good as a professional photographer. Um, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive, but they can be. Um, and the only other thing I will add is don't do free consultations if you can avoid it. Um, because your consultations, people are going to say, oh, I, I heard you have a free consultation. That's a great way to get people calling and in, but that's not a great way to make money. Um, consultations inevitably are going to last a lot longer than you scheduled them for, and people are going to want all sorts of legal advice for it. Value your time, and they will value, your clients will value your time. So however long you want to schedule a consultation for, be it 30 minutes, an hour, have maybe a reduced hourly rate for that period of time, but definitely get value for it because you're giving value for it. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Rachel, and that goes to the the top, one of the talking points that's on on topic for today. How do you re, how do you ensure that you're retaining a prospective client? And I can tell you that charging free consultations is the surefire way for you to waste a lot of time and not retain that client. Value your time. Value the advice that you're providing these people. They will respect you a whole lot more, and you will see they'll, they'll come around. I was just going to add. Uh, Kind of what Daniel said about the website, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is not very expensive at all. I've never spent $1,400 on a website. I've never paid anyone to do SEO for me. And if you search for a family law attorney in, in, in where I'm at in the Pearland area, I come up at the top. And so a lot of this stuff you can do yourself. This is a golden nugget that I wish I would have had before I started, but Creating content is work. It is not like, oh, let me just do this for 30 minutes and then I'm done. Like there are people who have marketing teams who come in on a Saturday and they shoot from the morning to, to Sunday, like from Saturday to Sunday, like this stuff is work. So on the content creation, um, I'm gonna drop my, my nugget, but Chad GPT is now out. And you can literally have Chat GPT to create content for you. So, for example, if you wanted an article to put out on um, best tips to tell a parent who's going through a custody case, right? Buzzwords, custody case, family, whatever. You have Chat GPT. You type that into Chat GPT. It will literally, within seconds, create an article for you. And then you can follow up with Chat GPT to say, create SEO, SEO. Uh, uh, buzzwords or keywords to put into this uh, website or to put into my um, article and it will then give you that information so instead of spending two three four hours on content creation you've literally spent 30 seconds you have an article you have seo keywords and now you can go work on other stuff that actually will help you make more money Thanks, Brenda. And I know a lot of us are intimidated by technology, but um, but yes, I think if you if you learn it um, and can figure out how to how to best use it, it's it's a great benefit. Um, so as Susan mentioned, you know you have that consultation. Um, how do you you know how do you close the deal? How do you ensure that that prospective client becomes a client? I think candor. You've got you have. A limited window to develop um, some level of rapport with this potential client. And I think that being candid and not over promising what you can do for them because you're trying to impress them is key. Uh, and if you don't know the answer to the question, and they're, I mean, after practicing for 16 years, I'm board certified in family law too, there are still questions that come up in a consult that I don't necessarily know the answer to. And so I will candidly say that's an it's an excellent point, and that's something that I, I'm not prepared to, to dive into with you today, but I can assure you I have the resources and I know where to go to, to get the question answered. And I think that people that are in an emotionally turbulent, 
in tumultuous state anyway, they appreciate some honesty because chances are they've had a spouse that's been lying to them or an ex-spouse slash co-parent that's been lying to them and, and, and trust is diminished. So I think that by building rapport through candor is key in, in making sure you close the deal and, and bring clients your way. I completely agree with Susan on this. Um, I will say I'm, I'm also at a, a larger family firm and we each attorney at our office does it differently. Everyone's got their own style and their own way of connecting with clients. Um, you know, you can connect with clients as parents, you can connect on all sorts of different ways. But uh, what's important is listening, <laughs> asking what brought you here, what, what are you looking to accomplish and not presuming you know what their goals are and letting them talk and tell you their story. You'll have questions and you'll step in with them, but quite frankly, letting them tell their story and you'll get to get those nuggets as, okay, okay, this is clearly an important issue to that person. And then not like, like Susan said, not over promising on a result. You know, it's very dangerous to guarantee what a judge will do because that's just not a great idea. So instead say, well, in my experience, this is maybe more likely to happen than not. Um, that being said, we run the risk of X issues if we try this. Um, but explaining the process, explaining, you know, how to file, how, you know, it takes this long, um, you know, here's what our initial disclosure deadlines are going to be, trying to give an idea of what some basic presumptions are and the basic process of filing that petition look like, and then working with that person collaboratively to figure out what their goals are and what the strategy would be. A lot of people come in and say, I do not want to go to trial, to which you say, okay, well, what are we going to do to get what you want then? And you, you work it out. And sometimes they say, well, I want to, I don't want to go to trial and I don't want to spend money, but this is the result I want. And then you have to say, well, I don't think we can do all of those things. So let's talk. <laughs> and, you know, I, in my experience, just like Susan said, the more honest you are with them, the more likely they are to hire you. I've left consultations, especially as a younger attorney thinking, well, I just disappointed this person. I just broke their heart. I just totally ruined their expectations. They're not going to hire me, but they do <laughs> because they appreciate that. And, you know, you're not doing anybody any favors by giving them information that you don't believe is correct or that, you know, advising them that a certain path is, you know, going to be cheap or feasible. I agree with, with Rachel. I think that, um, one, make sure, again, we'll say this throughout probably this uh, panel, but make sure you charge for your consultation. Um, but for my consultations, I'm always very honest about my, like, how I am and how I talk. I don't you know, present myself in any other way than who I am. Um, but with that consultation fee, I tell my clients, you know what, my marketing is done. It's not really done, but it's done. And I say that because I want them to understand that this is an opportunity for you to meet with an attorney, for you to discuss your concerns and for me to provide you value. I don't feel like anyone should be charging a consultation if you're not going to provide a person with value. So I'm listening to their facts. I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm asking questions as a, like as an experienced attorney. And then I'm giving them, one, I want you to understand the legal issues regarding your case. And two, I want to provide you with a strategy on how to move forward. So when you leave my office, you should have more information than you did coming in. If you don't have more information about your case, then I did not provide provide you with a quality consultation. And that's just how I feel. Uh, and, you know, and I always say, you know, there is no, um, this, the goal of this consultation is not to get you to retain me. A lot of attorneys, is, their whole consultation is all marketing. Well, I can do this for you. I can do this for you. And I can do this for you. No, my goal is not that. My goal is to focus in on you and your concerns and your issue and provide you with a strategy on how to move forward. Now with that strategy, right, you're giving them a lot of information and it is a lot of information and there's a lot of things that need to be filed and there's a lot of things that need to be done and that becomes overwhelming and the marketing it's, it's marketing but not really the marketing is you need an attorney to do all of this for you because you're not going to be able to do it by yourself nor are you in, in in the right state of mind to do this stuff for yourself So, you know, hopefully you, that client has- just, If I could just chime in on one more thing with that. Of course. You also need to be using your initial consultations to determine if the, the prospective client is really a good fit for the way that you style your practice. Um, if, you know, it's, that's a personal decision to each practitioner, but you know, you, you start to sit through enough of these consultations to learn whether or not 
you think that this client might be a problem for you. Uh, and so it, it goes both ways, similar to the withdrawal process. Clients can fire you, you can let clients go because if you establish goals early with the client, you collaborate with them, you inform them about the process, you give them that value that they've paid you to give you and they aren't listening and they're deviating from the goals or they're completely changing up the script or you find out down the road beyond the consultation that they've not shared the entire truth with you, then you need to be cognizant of that as you work through your representation, even if you're like, yeah, high five to me, this client ended up hiring me. Um, but you've got to be cognizant of that throughout the course of your representation as well. Susan brings up an amazing point that is very important for when you start get started. Have one of the other important parts of the consultation, and you know, they're they're a blur, like I said, they always will go long, no matter what. Um, but uh to talk about, you know, the Part of it is also say, okay, if you want to hire me, here's here's how you do it. Here's my representation agreement. Here's my retainer. And I refuse to tell people what the retainer will be until after I've talked to them because I need to know this person. Some of the things that we talk about could maybe raise a few red flags as to, okay, this person may not want to be as honest with me as someone else. Or we might have a lot of issues with um, management for whatever reason, in which case, you know, your retainer should go up. And people will always ask, well, how much is my case going to cost? And the answer should always be, I have no idea because you don't know. You should, um, you know, at least the way I've always practiced is we charge a retainer and we bill hourly against it, send billing statements out every month and, you know, that show what work was done by whom and at what rate and shows what's being, you know, transferred from trust, their IOLTA account to us and what remains in the trust account. Um, and that's a very important process to explain to people. So a lot of people don't understand what a retainer is. You need to explain that it's a deposit. It is not a guess as to what your case will cost. It is not a guarantee as to what your case will cost. And having that conversation is very important for setting expectations because next thing you know, um, you know, you've blown through a retainer with someone because situation is not as you thought it would be. And they're like, well, I only, I already paid you. Why do you need more money? And having all this drawn out, not only in your consultation, but in your representation agreement that you go over with them, that you make sure they sign, have a copy of the lawyer's creed attached to it as well. That is also very important to kind of set that expectation as well. To say, well, in the agreement that you signed, it said that this was a deposit. <laughs> you know, you still owe us, you still have to pay your bill after that. And sometimes there's replenishment, sometimes, you know, there's not, but it also is refundable to the extent it's not used. You know, people need to understand what we're doing and how we're paid. Um, and they also need to know that it, we can't control all parts of that. You know, some of this will depend on what the other side does, what the court does. Um, you know, we can't you know, obviously we'll be talking to them and they'll be knowing, you know, what's going on in their case, but uh, we, don't, we can't completely control cost. Um, I find being upfront about that really does help uh, negate problems down the line. You will always have some people who have problems down the line, but having a clear representation agreement and having gone over with them in that initial consultation will save you a lot of trouble down the road as well. And, and I'd like to add to that, um... You know, I agree with everything that everyone said. Um, just make sure you guys, I mean, this is family law. Don't flat fee your clients to, to try to get them in. Yeah, I see a lot of, don't, don't flat fee uh, because this is not the type of case where you flat fee. Nowhere in family law should we be flat feeing anything. Just stay with hourly. Uh, you will thank me uh, every single time because I've seen people flat fee. I joined a firm when I first started and it was flat fee. It was literally the worst thing that you could put yourself and your client in um, because they can have uh, expectations that are that are unreasonable because they know that you're on the hook regardless. Um, number two, uh, now you don't have negotiation pressure when you're at mediation. And when the mediator says, well, hey, are you sure you want to continue to pay Daniel, this extra retainer. Uh, those are always ways and effective ways to uh, get your own client to negotiate in a very fair and effective manner uh, where, where it is in their best interest because when they get to court, you know, they whatever they got at uh, mediation might not be there anymore. Um, and so make sure you do yourself a favor and do that. Uh, also charge a retainer that you think maybe it doesn't cover the entire case, but at least get get you past uh, temporary orders, at least that. 
because if you're you're charging, you know, one fourth of what it could get you to temporary orders, are you really going to withdraw before temporary orders? You know, and, and does that even cover the cost of your withdrawal? So, you know, sometimes you know you you're in a desperate situation. Don't don't do that. Don't do that move. It's it's not good. It's uh it's in bad and poor taste. It may be even uh you know a bit deceptive. So stay away from those those actions. Stay away from you know that type of practice, uh, because in the long run, your clients will appreciate your candidness, your honesty, and that you know you told them up front like what the fees actually are instead of doing some uh, hiding you know what the actual cost is through some multiple payment plan that you know misleads. Thank you. Um, and can I get a couple of you to unmute? Um say what you do to stay up to date on changes and trends in the law. I'm sure there's a lot of things going on. So how do you make sure that you're you're up to date? So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that we, we can, I can pay for CLEs, but obviously HLRS does a great job of generating free CLEs, State Bar of Texas um, and, Rachel had mentioned the advanced family law uh, seminar that we have every year in San Antonio, just to give you an idea of how voluminous the topics are and the breadth of which they run, it lasts four days. It's a four day seminar. So obviously people don't have, may not have the resources to go there, but look at the state bar website because they also offer a discounted fee to watch that seminar on video and at your, at your leisure. So that may be a more affordable way of really doing a deep dive into all the aspects of family law once that um, once that seminar concludes in August. I'll also add to that, and again, Susan's completely correct, um, the uh, Houston um, Bar Association has a family law section that if you have the ability to join, it's not particularly expensive join. You get a little uh, handbook uh, every year that's very hand, that's really great to bring the trial tool toolkit. It's great to bring the mediations into court. It's a great little cheat sheet for certain things. Um, so there's resources available. There's also a CLE available. There's luncheon CLEs every month um, that are done by the judges, done by practitioners about very relevant changes in the law. And it's a really good way to keep on top of things. You also get access to a bunch of articles and past CLEs on the website. So I would highly recommend that as well. You can also go to the law library. Um, you know, I think every county has one. Fort Bend, Harris County, um, they have free access to LexisNexis and uh, Westlaw. Um, in addition to that, uh, you can also check out the uh, Texas legislature site. Um, they have some new law changes um, that I think that they're looking at. Uh, and there's always a ton uh, every odd year. So this year, all those changes will be hitting, hitting us around September 1st, but you can take a peek at them. I think, I think around June is when everything gets passed. So if you keep an eye out, um, you can kind of get ahead of it if you'd like to. Um, and generally the application of that, you know, we all have to adjust to it after it gets passed. But if you have that extra time and you want to get ahead of it, just to kind of see where it's going, um, you can always check that out at the legislative side. Well, we are at time. This has been such a great discussion. Susan, Rachel, Brenda, and Daniel, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. I think it's super helpful to everyone involved. And for all of you out there um, that are new to the practice of family law um, or want to build up your practice, please consider joining HLRS. Um, the membership benefits are great. You get the screen referrals, um, and it can really build up your client base. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us.